characteristics. Well, first, let me mention at the outset that if you were to show a cell phone to a caveman, the caveman would first think that it must be a polished rock because that's what the caveman saw all of his life. And you have to understand all these astronomers saw rocks, either rocks mm -hmm. covered with ice that become comets <clears throat> or just rocks that are called asteroids. And obviously, they will try to fit it into that category. But the problem is there are many anomalies of this object. And at first, you know, I thought one anomaly is not enough to argue that it's artificial. But so first of all, it's, it has a very extreme geometry. So the amount of light that it reflects varies by a factor of 10 over an eight hour uh, tumbling period, spin period. And, uh, you know, even if you take a razor thin piece of paper, uh, when it tumbles in the wind, you would uh, not change the area that you see in the sky by more than a factor of 10, you know, because it's very unlikely that it will be exactly edge on uh, at any point in time. And in fact, we concluded that it must be more than a factor of 10 uh, longer than it's wide with my student because there were some data points that were taken a few weeks later and it still had large variations. So as it moved in its orbit, you know, it changed orientation relative to the Earth. And then, you know, it's quite unusual to get some, it's at least a factor of a few more than you get for the most extreme comets or asteroids. The, so that's point number one. Second, the, the mere fact that we detected it is already puzzling because uh, I wrote a paper a decade earlier that this guy probably is not aware of, where we forecasted, this was the first paper forecasting how many interstellar rocks do we expect uh, using the, what we know about the solar system that, that loses objects, especially from the loosely bound uh, Oort cloud, that's the outer path. And we concluded that pan stars will see nothing. That's the telescope that detected, that discovered Oumuamua. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in order to explain a detection like Oumuamua out of a population of objects in at random trajectories, you know, then you need... Um, many orders of magnitude larger abundance than would be natural if you assume that other planetary systems are the same as the solar system. So if you take the abundance of stars, you associate a solar system around each of them, you would get at least a factor of 100 to 100 million fewer objects than you can, than you need in order to explain the detection, the discovery of Oumuamua. So we didn't expect pan stars to discover anything. I mean, this guy looked through the telescope, saw this this object and said, oh, great, it must be a comet. But the point is, you <laughs> wouldn't expect that if you go through the map. And if, you know, mm -hmm. there, there was actually a, an astronomer, Amaya Moore Martin, that went through the map afterwards and said that afterwards, you know, even, you know, it's still uh, off from any reasonable estimate for the number of rocks that you would expel from, from um, you know, planetary systems. Now, the, there is also the strange thing about it being at the local standard of rest that I describe in the book. It's sort of the mm -hmm. local parking lot. If you find a car there, you can't associate it with any, any particular house, you know, that it came from because it's parked in the local rest, you know, frame of reference and, and, and the solar system just moves and relative to it and, and bumped into it. Okay, so that's another peculiar fact because there are only one in 500 objects in uh, 500 stars in, in that frame, mm -hmm. so much at rest in that frame. Again, this, this observer would never even think about it because he doesn't care where this object came from. He just says, I see it. That's it. So for him, okay, I see it. Who cares? You know, why, why would that? But I'm saying this is a very low likelihood for it to be in that frame of reference once you analyze the data. So then on top of that, you have the fact that, again, this guy, Wirk, did not even uh, identify at first, but someone else. Michelli et al., they wrote an, a, a nature paper saying this object exerts an extra push. Now, usually for comets, the extra push is from the rocket effect. So now Wirk would say, okay, we don't see a, a, a cometary tail. We, we see nothing. I mean, actually, the Spitzer Space Telescope looked very deeply and couldn't see anything, any gases around it at a very tight, you know, put a very tight limit on that. The point that Wirk doesn't understand is that you need about a 10% of the mass of a comet to be evaporated in order to get the, the push that was detected. 10%, it's a tenth of the, you know, this is a football field object and a tenth of it needs to be lost through a cometary wind in order to get the push that was observed. Now, this is not a minute, so he might say to himself, 
Oh, you know, there are some comets that lose very little. In fact, there are asteroids that lose nothing. Fine. There are things like that. We have seen things like that. Therefore, this thing is not unusual. Of course. But if you put into the, the equation the fact that you need to provide the push that this object exhibited, then you conclude that it needs to lose a tenth of its mass. Then you conclude that if it loses a tenth of its mass, you know, it's really hard to avoid seeing that in a cometary tail. Imagine an object, a football field size, losing a tenth of its weight in something, you know, behind it. And then this guy, Wirk, says, oh, no problem. We, he just left pellets behind it that we cannot identify. It didn't. <laughs> so these pellets come out, big chunks, but nothing whatsoever in gas or smaller dust particles, nothing. Zero. We can't see it to a level of a few orders of magnitude with the species. Now, to me, it sounds unreasonable. Of course, this guy can say, oh, yeah, you know what? Um, you know, there are some objects where we don't see. Of course, there are objects where we, do, where we don't see a tail, but they don't have a push of this magnitude. So if yeah. you take the push into account and you ask, what do you need to lose? You cannot miss that thing in any comet that we have seen before. You cannot miss that. And, and the fact is, the second object that was noticed from interstellar space is called Gorisov, and it looked like a comet. So now, you know, these people look at it and say, great, great, it's natural, it looks like a comet. And they come back to me and say, doesn't that convince you that Oumuamua was also natural? And I say, it's exactly the opposite. Exactly. Exactly the opposite. And, and in fact, you know, when I met my wife, she looked special to me. And then when I met many other women, that didn't change my opinion about my wife. What does that have to do with that? You know, the, here is a, a plastic bottle that you find on the beach and all the other objects are seashells that are natural. Does that say that the plastic bottle must be natural as well? I mean, that is a ridiculous argument. So you have to understand the psychology of people is such that Always to associate anything you see with what you've seen before. Okay, that's a second. But a decent scientist, you know, someone that really looks at the, at the substance, has to look at it quantitatively and ask, is this in line with... And actually, there were, I should say, not everyone is like Wirk. Wirk is just an observer. You know, he doesn't think mm -hmm. very deeply about it. But there were three uh, people that, uh, or three groups, I should say, that looked carefully from the mainstream uh, community, looked carefully, how can we explain all these features of Oumuamua? So one of them, one group, uh, wrote a few papers concluding that maybe it's a dust bunny. <laughs> uh, by a dust bunny, what they mean is, you know, just the thing that you find in your, your household, a collection of mm -hmm. dust particles, very porous. In fact, they concluded that it has to be a hundred times less dense than air. Okay, so like a cloud of dust particles loosely bound together so that it can be pushed by sunlight. So it has a large area, very little weight, and it can be pushed by sunlight. Okay, so they wrote a se several papers on a dust bunny hypothesis. To me, it's less plausible than an artificial origin because a dust bunny like that, you know, may not survive millions of years in interstellar space. I don't think it can. They didn't demonstrate that. Um, then there was another suggestion. Maybe it's a hydrogen iceberg. Okay, that, that, there was a paper on that. Uh, something that we have never seen before. A dust bunny we've never seen before. A hydrogen iceberg we've never seen before. So I'm telling you that because any of the mainstream people that were serious astronomers or physicists that tried to attend to the details of the evidence in order to explain it, not just make blank statements, any of them had to come up with something that we have never seen before. And to me, that mm -hmm. says, if you are contemplating something that you have never seen before, let's compare all these something that we have never seen before and consider also the artificial origin as something that we have never seen. Why not? What's the problem with that? No, 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 no. There is a taboo. Don't discuss that. That is, it's like, you know, one plus one equal two. And then people tell you, you're not, you're not allowed to speak about two. Two is out of the, you know, so, <laughs> so I say, what do I do? No, you, I, I mean, anyway, so coming back to the hydrogen iceberg, the problem is not only that it was never seen before, but it will not survive the journey. We wrote a paper about it with uh, Tim Huang afterwards, so showing that it will evaporate very quickly. 
The reason they propose the hydrogen iceberg is because when, you know, just like a comet, it loses mass and then it gets propelled. But the uh, hydrogen is transparent, so you would not see it as a cometary tail. So they suggested a whole completely new, ob you know, type of object, hydrogen iceberg, frozen hydrogen, <laughs> and said, Oumuamua is this, you know. I think that, and, and, and so I think that um, an artificial origin is a possibility that is more likely than hydrogen iceberg or a dust bunny. There was a third suggestion, oh, maybe it's a shrapnel, a, a fragment of a bigger object that was ripped apart by a star when it passed close to a star. So with that, I have two issues. One, the chance of passing close to a star is small. Most of the objects will be far away. So why would you see the first, the most common object to be one associated with, with such an event? And the second issue is when you produce shrapnel, you know, pieces uh, through the tidal force of a star, it, they will be elongated, like cigar shaped. Mm -hmm. And the most likely explanation for the light curve of, of Muamua was a, a pancake shaped uh, object, mm -hmm. object that is flat. And that you don't, you cannot get from the tidal disruption of a big object. So you know, I'm, I'm just following what basketball coaches argue: <laughs> keep your eyes on the ball and not on the audience. Mm -hmm. So I keep my eyes on the ball, and then all these other people look at the audience and look at how many likes they can get, and you know. But it's not unless they address the issue. And then if they address the issues that, you know, the specific issues, they have to come up with something that we have never seen before. So I rest my case. I say, why not consider? And, you know, it's I'm just advocating getting more evidence on similar objects. Mm -hmm. So I'm just following the line of st standard scientific inquiry and I'm getting bullied. And, uh, you know, I get this backlash and that makes no sense in my opinion.